figured it was something that was slight at that point in the advertisement. So our request this year on behalf of the board is to display the banner uh, 30 days after if we get approval, um, to, to display it sometime this week for 30 days, and then um, display it sometime in May or June based upon the... Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> I, just, I, got, I got stuck over 30 days. I had a phone call, so I was okay. Perfect. So it's like 30 days uh, this starting this week, right through the month of October, if the board approves, you know, we can display this. Uh, um, we would like also request tonight to display it in either May or June based on the availability of the, you know, the, the number of spots. Depending on how the community is open, there's a lot of events. Like right now, there's one event, you know, that's not open. And then we would like to display it maybe September, October again, you know, next fall again. So we thought we'd just do one request for the next three months. We may or may not we'll see that at that point to display it again. So um, that's a request that the group would like to do. But it would only be for 30 days, we would definitely take it down after that. Because as we know, the community's open up again, there's a lot more events and things being displayed. Mike, are you there? Still well us? Mike, are you still on the meeting? Yes, I am. the The audio is very low. Well, have you heard the discussion so far? I I, I have heard the discussion. Okay. All right. Any, uh, questions, or any, any questions, comments? Um, so we don't have to. If we um, approve, it would be more or less like a special use versus like having to change the actual written policy because it, um, it's not advertising an event, which is what the policy is, but we could just do like a special yeah. use essentially. Yes, you could. Um, we briefly had this discussion, I think maybe when we were doing some of the uh, training that the concerns that was expressed in the past about um, allowing groups like WARC to come in and ask to fly a banner is that um, you're allowing that banner to be flown, uh, you're allowing that organization to use municipal space property, if you will. To, um, to promote an idea that they believe in. And the concern I have is what if it's a what if it's a slogan or an organization that the town does not feel is appropriate? So if you let work fly the banner, uh, I'm not suggesting we don't. I think there's another way to maybe do it. Is that I would suggest that this protocol is for banners that promote events, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to have uh, the, you know, the Rotary Club, not quite Independence Day, they fly the banner uh, two weeks before the event. The event comes down. They've got to take it down three days afterwards, and that's it. It's it's an advertisement that you're allowing the public space to be used for. <clears throat> for these types of things that Don and Mark are requesting tonight. And we don't have a policy yet, but uh, I think you could you could get around that. I think you need. To, I think it would be better if you said the town wants to fly this banner and make this statement, and then it's the town's statement. Uh, so Black Lives Matter, matter. The town of Waterloo believes that, and then if another organization comes in and says, we want you to fly our banner, the towns can say, well, we weren't flying Bork's Black Lives Matter banner. We were just flying a Black Lives Matter banner because that's what the town believes. It's the town's speech in that case. I think if you allow organizations to put up banners to promote their, their interests, then you have to allow every organization to do that. And there may be plenty of organizations out there that you don't want to be putting their, um, their, uh, 
their speech. Oh, so what exactly does the banner say, John? It says, uh, if I remember correctly, Waterbury area believes that Black Lives Matter. Okay, there's a small thing on there, which does say Waterbury area. It does so say your, the name of your organization. It doesn't, no, say, it doesn't say Waterbury. It says Waterbury, yeah. not. So when you say, when you say the town, that's kind of a broad brush statement. What exactly does that mean when you when you make the statement the town? The residents of the town? The same thing when you enter into a MOU with, with revitalizing Waterbury, whereas the town of Waterbury and revitalizing Waterbury, you are the town of Waterbury. You're the elected representatives of the town of Waterbury. And you can, you can make a contract, and you can decide this is something that we believe. If you, I'm not saying you have to do it. I'm just, I'm just cautioning you against that. If you allow this organization to put its banner up in a month, another organization that may be very different that you don't have the same feelings for, and might may, may have an opinion about something that you don't want from it. Well, I think, um, like you said, we don't have to do one or the other. Like, we get to go and decide as a yeah. board. Yeah. So you should do some... what we did the last time, right. which is to let them put it up for... Okay. Right. Um, so should another organization or should another banner come where the elected representatives we get to vote and we get to say no. So I think that slippery slope argument doesn't have to apply because that's it's our job to vote and make those decisions. So um, that said, I think that, um, I mean, I'm in favor. I think I'm interested to hear whether the 30 day um, feels like a good time period or if we want to maybe move to the two weeks keeping in junction with the other banners that we put up. Um, I'm open for either. Um, I personally think that as a town, or as a representative of a town, I would love to see the banner up and let me believe that Black Lives Matter. We've heard a lot of um, positive impact that's made on the safety, well being, and feeling of welcome and um, on folks who come here and work here and live here. So I see a, a large positive impact. So, is that, I guess, what one of my questions was going to be what are the goals and objectives of this banner? Uh, she may have, you know, defined some of it, um, but how about, how does, how does it represent other people of minority or other people, period? Uh, and I'm wondering if we're starting to walk down a slippery slope. It is a political issue, in my opinion. Um, and quite honestly, the taxpayers' dollars go towards operating the municipality and taking care of the municipality's business. I don't believe it's the business of the municipality to get into social issues. I think we need to stay in our lane and not veer off into other lanes because uh, of what you just talked about. Is there what type of liability issues are we? potentially setting ourselves up for uh, showing preference to some when, I mean, what it brings to mind to me is town meeting day. When we have town meeting day, it's the day for the people of this town. And this, you know, when, when you reference town meeting day, it's an opportunity for all the people of the town to come into the gym down there speak their mind through voting, and when they go in to get their names checked off at the voting checklist, there's no vetting of what minority you are, what religion you are, what uh, uh, political affiliation you're, you're uh, holding. You get to freely vote based on what's on the political voting cheat, but you're not turned away at the door because of any other reason than, you know, 
any other reason. You're not turned away because of your minority. You're not turned away because of your religious belief. And I think that we're, it gives me uh, the truth that we're treating everybody equal. We're, everybody gets to speak their piece through the voting process, you know, uh, without scrutiny. And I, I just think that the municipality needs to stay in its own lane on this and, and work towards the betterment of everybody without showing preference to anybody. I mean, we had a, we had a mission statement that Moroni brought to the table that we all adopted as a town. And, you know, maybe that ought to be read right now to refresh our memory what it was about. Uh, everybody in this town is treated equally. And as I said before, you know, I just worry about repercussions of favoritism towards one group or another. It just, it really upsets me that, that we even have to walk this path. Because when you say repercussions, can you clarify what you mean, like the legal repercussions? Or okay. I'm not sure what you mean. Yeah, hang on, man. Um, yes, I'm Ronnie and Mike that wants to speak. Sure. Yep. And yeah. I don't like my address. Okay. Yeah. However, yeah. they're keeping track of coming. I don't know how, how I want to say this, but there's been a couple instances that came to light to me here just recently. I heard one through a grapevine that really disturbed me. And um, so I called the gentleman up to find out the truth from the horse's mouth. He's a white male, blue collar worker, uh, actually works in factories, cleaning boilers and soot and HVA system, systems and you know, it's a nasty, grubby job, and he's done it for a lot of years. He told me to my, over the phone, not to my face, but over the phone, because I called him because I really wanted the truth. He went outside of the factory that he was working at and walked down the road to take a break from what he was doing because it was sweaty, nasty, whatever. Just stretch his legs a little bit. This black gentleman come around the corner and started screaming at him, calling him racist. At the top of his lungs, got right in his face, you effing racist, just was persistent. The guy said the hair was standing on the back of my neck. I didn't know what to do. He said, all I said was, I'm not a racist, and I just kept walking. He said he got right in my face. He was, he was pretty upset with me about it when he was talking to me. And... I just thought to myself, what, what would possibly bring this on, you know? So then I, so that's number one. Number two, I watched. How does that pertain to? Let me just finish these ideas here. I got my head. So I watched Channel 3 News the other day. They were talking about Hispanic Heritage Month. They were interviewing some kids down at college. One of the college boys, Hispanic college boys, was talking to the reporter and he said, you know, it's really nice to be down here where I'm amongst people like me. Now, can you imagine what that would have happened if I'd have said that? Yeah. They would have crucified me. Well, this might not... I don't think so that this I, is I'm the trying time to get to a point here, Dan. Okay. I'm trying to get to a point here. <laughs> All right. So then in Essex, Essex allowed the school system down there to fly the Black Lives Matter sign. You must have seen it. Mm -hmm. I believe it was the first night it was up, it was cut down and stolen. Okay. The American flag was left there in the dirt. When they were talking about the issue that took place, they said that it's possible that the Black Lives Matter sign, uh, banner, be, a flag being stolen could be uh, considered a hate crime. I said to myself, what about the American flag that's laying in the dirt? 
That doesn't represent anybody. You know, for me, when you cross the border into this country, you're not a hybrid American, you're an American, period. There's no, you know, ethnicity. I'm, my, my heritage comes from Canada, but I'm an American, plain and simple. That's the way I view it. And for me, it's like I'm, I'm almost getting tired of this double standard that's crucifying certain people for believing one thing, but yet other people can act out in such hatred. I mean, you and I and Mike and the other board members, we must have learned something behind closed doors. When are we gonna erase all this issue of who's different than who and just treat people the way they need to be treated? I think, that's, I think that's the end goal, but I think that we have work to do to get there and erasing it and not talking about it as elected officials in a town, I don't think is the way to go about it. But I don't know what other people. Leanne? Yeah, so I'd like to have that declaration read out loud that you guys adopted. I want to read it out loud. If you don't have it, I have it. So I, Bill, could you read it? Right, well, you can read it then. You have it? Not with me. <laughs> Do you have it? Waterbury condemns racism and welcomes all people, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity, or expression, age, or disability, and will protect these classes to the fullest extent of the law. As a town, we formally condemn discrimination in all of its forms to commit to fair and equal treatment of everyone in our community. Waterbury has and will continue to be a place where individuals can live freely and express their opinion. So I just had an epiphany while you were reading that. There's your banner, Maroney, right there. That's what it really needs to say. That's absolutely what it needs to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't Maroney's request. It was Don's. Well, I'm just. Yeah. You guys are kind of in on it. Sure. You know, yeah. as, as a group. sure. Absolutely. I just felt a little strange. I mean, how do you feel about that, Maroney? <laughs> Would that? Can I? Um, Chris, I am, so, I am so happy. I'm really thankful that you give me the opportunity to actually respond because I've been dying here to respond. And oh sure. boy, Chris, every time you get on a mic, I'm, I feel so sorry for you. I feel like you're getting yourself in more and more trouble, man. You need to get a communication director. I gotta say that straight up. Um, you're sitting here talking about Black Lives Matter is a political statement. I'm sorry, how many times do we have to go over this again? Black Lives Matter is an international society movement. It was formed in the United States in 2013, dedicated to fighting racism and anti-Black violence, especially in the form of policy brutality, police brutality. And I've explained this again when I introduced the idea of putting up the banner. The name of Black Lives Matter actually signals the condemnation of unjust killings of Black people by police. Black people are far more likely to be killed by police in the United States than white people and any other marginalized community. By the way, I'm sorry if you feel like saying Black Lives Matter actually demonize or marginalize other community, but no, actually other minority groups believe and understand what the term Black Lives Matter stands for. And they are behind and with us on this issue. So, and I also wanna say this, Chris, to you personally, I'm so sorry and it feels so sad to me that you keep making this so personal between me and you. You have referenced my name in here three times. I am not Waterbury Anti-Racism Coalition. This is a group of people. We have 300 members, okay? So please stop making this about me and you. I introduced the statement and every select board member adopted it and told me that they were gonna vote on it. Unless you, unlike you, you wanted to make it between me and you. You wanted me to come to your shop and talk about it. No, I wanted to try to find some neutral ground between you and I. You called on my name. So 
I'm sorry. For some reason you don't want them. The select board, the select board actually voted to adopt the statement. So please stop making it about me. And when you talk about the what the banner, you as a select board, you are the body making decision for the town. Now, if you want me to go get the petition to get members of the town to say yes, they stand with the Waterbury movement, I will do that. But you need to understand your responsibility. As a select board, you make decision on behalf of the town. And we came to you. And you said, yes, we could put that banner up. So it's very offensive to me sitting here and listening to you saying, oh, that does not represent the town. But you, as a bunch of just few members, make the decision on behalf of the town. That's why we came to you. And so please, Chris, last time, Stop making this about me and you. I have no problem with you. As you claim yourself to be just a construction man, you have served this town. Stop making this about me and you, okay? Just stop. It sounds like there's some misconception here. So we'll, we'll stop this and allow uh, Mike Bard to, to weigh in on this. Thank I'm you, Mike. I'm glad I could respond on the record because I'm sick of you. Well, I think that's... Stop it there. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, I I just want to first preface that one I'm I'm supportive of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, black people, people of color, a lot of minorities have been, uh, you know, that they, there's been a lot of mistreatment over over history. That's totally undeniable. But the question before us, I think, is a, a little bit more direct, and I want to talk to that. I thought Bill Sheplock's memo to the board was quite right on the point. I'm really concerned that if we start every movement, you know, I, I think it's good that, you know, we allow, you know, certain banners to go up for a certain period of time to promote events. I think that's great. You know, if there's Hispanic Heritage Month, Black History Month, I think it's great that, you know, you know, we would we would fly a banner to promote those things. But I think the slippery slope is, as I think it's been said, is that I think if we start taking political statements as a board and as a community, I think that that puts us into question, you know, you know. This is before us, but what happens if a group of white supremacists came before us and asked us to fly something? I think, you know, there would be a, a big uproar if we even considered to do that. So that's why I think it, we'd be we'd be better off. I, I like the existing policy to allow certain banners to be to be flown. But again, I don't think it's something that the, 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 the town is should be totally representing i think we have represented and i'm proud of our declaration of inclusion i think we we all want to live by those standards i think it's important you know i moroni i love you know what, what what you're standing for but i do think you know i hate seeing more and more divisions in our community and that's what i'm concerned about so that's why i'm i'm a little bit hesitant as bill said in his memo to you know, have, you know, change the policy that we have to allow banners to fly, you know, on special events and, and, and stuff like that. But, you know, as to have, you know, long term, you know, banner flying, I think is probably not the best thing for us to do as a, you know, in a, a, you know, as a voting body. It's my, like my a couple points of A couple points of clarification. Bill's recommendation was not that we change the policy, but that we fly the, fly, the banner as a town. So we would not need to change the policy. Right, right. Second, um, comparing the ask of raising a white supremacist banner and a Black Lives Matter banner is a false dichotomy and it's not the same. Um, and third, we also take saying that if we fly one, we have to fly another takes away our power as a board. We have a voice, we have voting power, we have this discussion. We also get to have input from the town. So I, would, I, just, I would recommend that if that's your position, yeah. Danny, and I, I understand it, but what I was suggesting, this protocol that we have right. is um, 
or events banners. That's what it speaks to, right. events. Right. So, you know, the Rotary Club uh, pie for breakfast. Or I'm, I'm super clear. Happened. I just meant that so we don't have to change the protocol to vote on that. Yeah. I believe that if you allow a group to to make a statement, Maloney says this isn't a political statement, but it is a statement that an organization or wants to state on municipal property. If you allow them to make that statement, I believe you have to allow every organization to make their statement. Which is why I repeated what you said, which well, is why we would make the statement as a town, not the organization, right? You don't, you have to vote. Just vote on decisions and actually, this is what, you have the power to vote. You can vote on a Black Lives Matter banner, just like you would vote on a white supremacist banner. Just do it and let the voters know where you stand. You have the power to do it. Just do it. We're not saying don't accept one or the other. This is the opportunity to know, to let the public know where you stand. Are you actually going to accept the Black Lives Matter banner and the white supremacist? Because you have the power to do that. And if you just Maroney, do it and let Maroney, the voters know where you stand. Maroney, you know, please don't interrupt, okay? I was still speaking. If she does it again, I was still speaking. I think you ought to get a legal opinion before you decide to allow this organization to put up their speech and if you want to deny another organization. If you want to make a motion tonight that says the town will fly the Black Lives Matter for the next 30 days, I agree you can do that right now. The town can fly the Black Lives Matter flag. Not WARF, because if you allow WARF to fly it, that if another group comes in and wants to fly something that you right. find distasteful, you will have a difficult time yeah. saying no to that. So you want to make it yeah. the town, I think you can. Right. So I just want to emphasize that the Black Lives Matter banner statement is not political. Defund the police, that's a policy, that's political. This is about valuing members of the community. And Chris, the town meeting day, we vote as a community all kinds of values. For example, we vote for domestic, you know, against domestic violence. That's a value judgment that people shouldn't be beating each other up and, you know, in relationships. We vote to support kids who are abused. We vote all kinds of values all the time. This is a value, not a political statement. I just want to emphasize that. This is not to vote a certain way or please support this policy or whatever. Um, so that, that's my, you know, so we do that all the time. If you want to have the, this organization go to town meeting, because most of that's for money, but if you want us to put a value up there, fly the flag on a certain amount of time, let the people vote on it, that's one route you can go. I'm just been, saying, I have considered that. If you want. Uh, and on the other question on the town voting, uh, there's a Supreme Court uh, docket coming through soon that the, city, the, um, the town offices, the city of Boston, has three flags, polls, you know, Massachusetts. United States flag, and they've had 238 different organizations fly a flag on the other pole over over time. There was a there was a Christian group of some sort that wanted to fly their their name and the cross above it, and they said no because it's you know religion and government separation. They uh, thought the situation is now going to Supreme Court, whether they everybody has a right to put their no matter what it is in a way. I mean it's free speech or so. Let's see if that plays out. But that was a value that that select board or the city council, or whatever, voted we're not going to put that flag up. So that's going right through the document of the Supreme Court. So I don't know where that's going. No, no, I, yeah. I understand that, that, that the, the court will adjudicate that. What I'm saying is if the town decides it wants to say Black Lives Matter, the select board can say that and they can allow that up. And I also look today to see how many flags and things are up, banners, and there's a just, I, mean, I know this is tricky. I was in your seat for four years. I know how difficult this is. But there's a flag banner up there now supporting a waste field ski and uh, whatever, ski thing. Why am I, our tax dollars supporting the waste field? Your tax event? dollars aren't supporting that. I mean, the, <laughs> I'm just saying we could have every town early. If you put one up, we could have, you know, one player. I'm just saying, I guess that's it. It's an event. Part of, part of, I understand. Of, and, or part of my rub about this whole thing is for me, if we, 
make an ordinance or something that just doesn't allow for any of this, isn't it the same thing as allowing for all of it? It, it, it kind of a, I mean, that mission statement seems to hit the nail on the head. Right. You can't hang it up on there. Nobody would read it. Really <laughs> There's too many words. I mean, you know, this encapsulates a value part. A couple of people from the public here would wish to speak to this blonde lady first, and then you just let us know your name and then. Sure. My name's Elizabeth. Um, I personally think I appreciate all the people that have come out tonight. Uh, I just haven't signed up for that at the last minute, so I didn't prepare any remarks in particular. But um, based on what's been said thus far, I do have a couple of questions. Number one, there seems to be to the board members uh, a few months ago, and 
which the public has heard it. So, as a biracial individual living in Waterbury, I watched in disbelief this past year as people rallied behind a political agenda disguised as a social justice movement. Following George Floyd's tragic death, the perfect storm occurred, and the Black Lives Matter organization jumped to the forefront with their slogan, Black Lives Matter. People who tend to disagree with the organization are labeled racist. Their goal was to influence the presidential election, which they stated on their website. BLM enthusiasts achieved that goal when their slogan became part of the Democratic National Convention's mantra. For a moment, I was proud to see that Waterbury was starting an anti-racism coalition and hoped that anti-racism was their legitimate goal. If this was the case, why not be more direct and support anti-Asian and anti-Semitic racism as well? But I was disappointed to experience firsthand that the anti-racism coalition is merely using another name to push a BLM agenda. When I requested the opportunity to speak at the Waterbury rally against racism, I was denied and told that the event was in solidarity with the BLM movement and our speaking will be focusing on that. Evidently, this affair was one-sided, and they did not want to look at the current racist situation where other racial minorities are being overlooked. I shook my head as government offices, schools, and other public institutions raised banners and used this political organization prayer. It's time to remove the banner at the entrance to Waterbury, which obviously we're here for someone requesting for it to be going up again. But this damaging political ideology is not reflective of the beliefs of all the monitors. And as it was learned in the diversity training classes, which Danny was nice enough to post on front porch forum for us, the question that you ask yourself is does this work for everyone? And I don't think it works for everyone because the excerpt from the BLM impact statement, which can be found on the BLM website is our foray into electoral politics began through the creation of the Black Lives Matter Political Action Committee. Since its launch in October 2020, the BLM PAC now has two elections under its belt, the 2020 general election and the 2021 Georgia Special Senate runoff. Politically, we are just getting started. And that's from BLM's website. So you can't say that they're not political when they're saying that they are. But to me, a political banner has no place in our town. It will exclude some rather than being inclusive for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'd like to make a comment. Sure. <clears throat> You want, you know, there's billboards. Why not rent it if that's what you want to do? It doesn't have to say Waterbury stands, Waterbury support. Rent a billboard. No billboards in Vermont. I'm saying. Well, change that. That's what we want to do. Let me know what that is. Yeah, um, I guess my problem with this line was the fact that it said Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter. Um, who is Waterbury? Waterbury is me. I'm a resident. Yeah, you have the vote, Amy, but I am a resident and I do have a say. And by your mission statement, it says I have a say. Okay. okay. I do not stand with Black Lives Matter. And if I am Waterbury, how can you pull something like that or you guys agree to do that? I don't stand by Black Lives Matter any more than I stand with the Ku Klux Klan. I don't stand with anyone. I stand for all. Everyone's equal. That's it. If that's what your Declaration of Inclusion says, that you guys all voted on, except I will admit Amy, you did not much. You weren't on the board. So why did this, did something change that makes us not think that everybody all lives matter is there really who want does Waterbury want to say that black lives matter and not say well all lives matter 
You're right, we do vote all kinds of social things there. But in people, you don't pick one and say, Waterbury stands with. How can you say that? And like she said, it is political, period. If you're saying Black Lives Matter and their mission statement says that, I don't know what else you can say. Thank you. Anybody else? I would put forth a different idea instead of putting up that banner. Could, if this is work uh, pushed forward, pick a few key phrases or words uh, from our mission statements there that they could also put on a banner that we have already agreed on the language. So we can, you know, we're in support of everything uh, in, in our mission statement. So I feel like that encompasses a lot of what your group feels towards. So would that be a happy meeting that you could take back to rest, the rest of your group to discuss? And if there are some words or a phrase in it that you especially like, we could come back as a board and talk about that and uh, possibly hang that up on a banner for a period of time. I don't know if you were sitting here when I, when Carla read it, were you here? I just left me. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to be, could I interject? Hang on, Mike, because I, I don't know if you heard me say that there's there's the banner right there. I know, but I also but, I know with the too many words in the yes, exactly. I get, the I get it. I get it. But <laughs> so I agree with you. Yeah. Okay. You know? Mike. Mike, yes, go ahead. I, I want to make a motion that Waterbury flies a banner that includes our declaration of inclusion. And I'll leave it at that, and then I'll go out the comments uh, if, if there's a second. Is there a second? I guess I would just like that broken down more because right. like we can't, so I would like to maybe amend that and, and say what I, I said, okay. like take that back to your- An reward. acceptable version? And, and, yeah, short and abbreviated, what abbreviated what, what you most connect word. with and then okay. come back and then we can agree upon it if it, and then and then go from there and fly it, if that sounds agreeable to all parties. That would be agreeable. You guys can I, I think I think that's- uh, saying, it's everybody. Volume. It's not just us. You make up the town too. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, the comments I've heard tonight, I could go 10, 15 minutes. I can't counteract a lot of those that I've heard today, but I'm not going to get into that because we know around the country this is going on school board meetings. It's going everywhere. Yeah. There's theories that, you know, things that are out there that people now think are political and people creating all kinds of stuff, but I'm not going to go that But path. is that an honest request, so, if, if that works for you, to bring it back to you? I can't know. speak for the whole organization, if that's an honest request. You know, I, mean, I, I would like to put that forward. Yeah. Okay. So does Mike need to can I, revise his uh, motion? Yeah. I, I can do Does that. Have, yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll wait till we get a second, and then you want to revise that, Mike, or amend it, I guess? Hmm. Um, Maybe with some um, of Katie's help. If someone else can take a stab, because um, my audio is going in and out. Danny, can could you follow up on your comment? No, well, I just think maybe we need more time. Like I don't. I think it's a, it's almost like a separate thing. Like if we want to do that as a board, maybe we want to have a full conversation as a board. Which I think feels like a separate request than the WARP request. And so it might deserve a little more conversation, ideally with all five of us. And each bring up their own ideas. Yeah, or, or look at the statement together and pick right. like what we represent and would right. work. And be in favor. since we spent so much time already, maybe we want to spend more time at another meeting. Well, I'd be glad to you know, withdraw the, my motion to a later date. But I, I was thinking that my motion helps with the whole intent with what Wark wants to do with the Black Lives Matter um, banner and, and stuff. I think it's just real, you know, I think as Bill laid out, you know, I'm just so concerned about, you know, as much as, you know, I, I feel very much in favor of all forms of inclusion, all forms of diversity. It's just very difficult for a political body, you know, to, to entertain 
political speech, uh, you know, as an institution. And I don't know, I just, I'm just really concerned about, you know, as lawyers would say, the unintended consequences of, you know, you know, changing what our current policy is. So I have for some reason, for some reason, Mike, I, I believe that the, the path that's currently being taken isn't bringing the people involved to where we want to be. It's creating too much conflict. So maybe we need to create a different path that's more acceptable and more inclusive and more can actually have some teeth to it and, and gain some ground here because it mm -hmm. seems like in the last year, all we've done is gone the other way. I mean, when people are confronted down in Burlington and screamed at, that's, that's not forward motion, that's decline in its worst form. Uh, and, you know, that's why I, I asked about the goals and the objectives because it really doesn't seem to be any that are that are making substantial ground in the right direction. So I think Katie's idea was, and Danny's idea was good. Maybe if a motion needs to be put in place to secure that idea in movement, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to structure that, but a motion, well, could you help a motion to table this and come back with uh, yeah, well, you don't need a motion to the table because okay. there's, there's. But I would like it on I, the schedule to be discussed again. I think Mike's the concern yeah. was that it be a motion be made that kind of ratifies the idea that we had that that would be worked on. Is that correct, Mike? Or am I misunderstanding? So you have a, you have a request from Black Lives Matter right now to consider. I think you need to, you can, if you're wanting to give some consideration to something else at a future meeting, you can say it, but I think you need to act on the request and say, we're not ready to do this right, right. now, yeah. we'll take this up under advisement at a future meeting. Yeah. But I don't think you need to make a motion about what you're gonna do at the next meeting. I think you just. I have that Mike withdrew his motion. Yeah. So then, should we vote on we need the current proposal on? in place, which is? I don't think you need to vote on it. Okay, you can you can state that you're not ready to act on this given your conversation, and that you will take up the subject at a subsequent meeting. That, that's good enough. No wording. Help under a different structure or anything like that. We'll just put that on the agenda for the future meeting. Just you just need to take place on a future agenda, right? So I'm sorry. I think I think the board's kind of gotten the message. Um, so that's what we'll do then. So where is this a yes or no? I don't I didn't hear it well. That's what I said. Oh Teresa, I'm sorry. Yeah. I forgot. Pardon um, pardon me for oh, forgive me. Um, I'm just, uh, it, it feels like things have gotten a little convoluted, you know, sitting in the audience here. Um, so it, it, the, I, I would be delighted if this town um, it does something with its mission, its vision statement there and does something about it. But as Bill just said, you have a request from an organization that you either have to say you're going to act on or you're not going to act on. Um, and that seems to me to be separate from the town making a statement and um, you know it's on our website and decided to put a banner up that has something you know akin to that on it. It's, it's two separate things, um, and so we can obviously can decide not to act on the request for that. Um, but I, I think the public needs to be clear about um, like going forward what would be the intent. Um, so the town deciding to do something uh, on its own is not the same thing as responding to the request for more. 
in my opinion. That's why I said either either approve or disapprove. Well, you, you can do that, and I, I don't mean to belabor this. I would recommend that, I, I think there is an issue that you have a, an organization making a request to fly something, whether they want to say it in the name of the town, it, I don't remember, but I believe Leanne, if it said Wabri supports Black Lives Matter or Wabri, if you have a concern about that, that's fine. I think what you could do and reasonably is to say, we have a policy that's nebulous with regard to requests from organizations to put something other than uh, advertising events on your band. We can direct staff to get an opinion about whether if you allow this organization to fly, if you say yes to this request to this organization, does that tie your hands if other organizations make the request? And how does that differ from deciding in the name of the town to do something? I agree with Maroney. If you tonight wanted to say, Waterbury will fly the Black Lives Matter banner on its banner pole in the name of Waterbury, you can do that. And that doesn't open you up to having to fly any other organization's uh, slogan, if you will, because you're making that decision in the name of Waterbury. If you're not ready to do that, I would suggest that you ask staff to get some more information and take this up at a future meeting. And suggest a compromise, which is right now is a weird word, word in this day and age, but uh, I'm wondering if the board Again, on the to have the town, not war. If you would fly the Black Lives Matter banner for a month in, and tell the community, we are now going to look at the whatever that resolution is to come up with a, a broader wording at the next time that you spot when we can do that. You know, we can post it every other month or so on, but at least support this level right now until you come up with other wording just for 30 days and then take the request off of the other 60 days. I'm just saying it's compliments. That would have to come from the select board. I mean, that's your call. I see that compromise, and I honestly think that we could get that wording up, the wording that from our mission statement up on a sign in less than that time. Yeah, well, that, yeah. yeah. But at least it's supporting the people in the community right now. But you're asking the board to make a decision to fly the Black Lives Matter. Uh, yeah, for 30 days or less based on this other banner. Oh. I'm not willing to walk that path, but. Is it still going to say Waterbury stands for it? Yeah, it's the same. No. So are you asking us to take a vote now on that? I didn't make a motion. No, understood. I'm just, I'm just saying, so our- I, I just need to know what we're doing. We either we're hanging or we're not. So I think the direction that we were going in, and please correct me if I don't speak for everybody, was that we were going to not take any action on the request and then revisit the conversation next time with, like Teresa said, it's, it's almost a different issue. So we would not take action on this, come up with something as a board representative of that mission statement. I personally think it would work well to have you and or other representatives from work to see if it works together. It might not work for you. You still might come back with the same request and then we vote on it. That's totally fine. But I think that's the path that we're looking at, which would not, which would mean we wouldn't vote on hanging the, the Black Lives Matter banner. However, it's you're within your right to ask us to vote on the, on that thing. Tonight. You don't just need to know what we're doing. Sure. sure. What we're doing. He can yeah. ask you to vote, but you don't have I to know. vote. I know, and I just wanted to respect him and see if that's what he wanted for tonight. So, if not, it's okay. So is your what you just said? Are you yeah. giving any consideration to what I stated? Asking staff to determine yeah. to get a legal I would opinion. Highly recommend that we ask you to do that. <laughs> I I agree hundred percent with Danny. I think that's a great great pass that we should take. Yeah, me as well. So then we'll take no action on this. The act, on yeah, agenda. but on no vote. But the action would be to add that to the agenda and then to ask or direct staff Correct. to research. Like getting a legal opinion, essentially, on putting. And then consider putting a mission statement mm -hmm. in Some a different structure. Yeah. 
again, publicly. Still keeping the mission statement the way it is, but, the way it is, but, but maybe structuring yeah. something that we can put up as a banner yeah. that is acceptable yeah. to everyone. Bill, just <laughs> Do we have a motion? Are we good? No. Good? All right. By consensus, we're not here. Okay. You good with that, Mike? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, right. everybody, for coming. Yeah. Dog, you want to the... just report on the Maple Spirit thing? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I asked Bill if Maple Spirit could put on kind of a that wouldn't be a contest, but a proposal to paint some of the huge black, you know, and green electrical boxes that are now around town, right on Stowe Street, Maine. This happens in a lot of towns. I've driven around, there's artwork on these electrical boxes. So I called Green Mountain Power and the woman said, let me check with somebody, came back. No, we don't allow anybody to paint our boxes. So when I was at a doctor's appointment, what started this is I saw a box painted while I was waiting for my wife to come check me up and I took a picture of it to show the Makersphere group. Well, I looked at it and I blew it all the way up and it's a Green Mountain Power Box that is painted. So something isn't right there. You, I don't know who's doing what or maybe they changed the policy. So until I get clarity from you know, Green Mountain Power, I'll come back and ask if the select board is willing to have, not all of them, there's like 24 boxes in town. Some of the little ones, the, the, it's just those big ones on the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Park Row and yeah. Main Street, and right the ones on you know Stowe Street and Main. They're just you know why not doll those up a little bit? Yeah. So I got to so check. If, if you if you have time when you when you're doing nothing, you might want to give Bill Woodruff a call. Okay. And ask him to show you which boxes we own, because okay. I I think I put in the email to you that I believe the boxes at Bank Hill and Park Row. That control the traffic lights. Right. I believe we own those. Okay, lights. that's a great idea. Thank so you. there's other. So there's some boxes that we own that we could give you permission for, but I don't want to give you permission <laughs> to do things until I know which ones we own. No, no, that's fine. I, I talked to Bill about yeah, it, so yeah, you can get with him and he can show you which ones you could ask permission for. And, and I'll get clarity from them because there's also the boxes on Bidwell Lane, you know, right where they put those large poles up. Yeah, I think those yeah. are green mountain power. No, I know they are. I'm just saying that something's not right. Yeah. 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 Um, I think it's Brian Dooley that you would probably contact, correct? At Green Mountain Power? Yeah. So I have his number if you Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Can I make a suggestion for um, the box? Yeah. Um, I since I've not heard of this, I think it's an interesting idea I've given to other communities. I would ask you perhaps for this year, or for the revitalizing library with the design committee, because we spent a lot of time in the town with some of the um, design elements, mm -hmm. and it might be interesting yeah, to work together and we can coordinate some of those initiatives with us. Yeah, and this is just not the case. So yeah, I can't yeah, I agree. I'm going to see if we can do it first. Because then we can look at what colors, if there's any kind of right. anyway, all right. those kind of elements of the town will, you know. Just trying to suggest some coordination. Right, right. Absolutely. Maybe we could get to that point. Okay. So, Thanks, so, Thank you. All right, thank you. I'll type that name in if you can send me a number. Yep. Okay, thank you. Bill Woodruff has it. Yeah. Has that. Okay. Right. Bill I'll Woodruff is on. Thanks, Don. Okay, we can move forward here. Um, revitalizing Waterbay. Karen. Okay, so Karen is here with Mark Familio. Uh, Mark is, you might remember, is the economic development director. Uh, he's been here for a few months now. And Karen is the executive director of Revitalizing Waterbury. Um, just to remind the board, we do have a memorandum of understanding with Revitalizing Waterbury, and it talks in the MOU. Did everybody get it? Does anybody need a copy of it? Um, the MOU, the MOU requires us to tell um, Revitalizing Waterbury by October 1st whether we're going to provide funding for them in the next year or not. Um, it's October 4th now. Um, this MOU has uh, kind of moved forward a couple of different times. And, you know, now I'm fortunately remembering that it's October. And then when I dragged it out the other day, I said, oh, 
this means we should have talked about this in September. So, um, and uh, graciously has said, well, if the board tells me tonight that they don't want to support us next year, we'll consider it timely. Um, I hope that we won't do that. Um, I believe that RW has provided good service to the community and to the town and to the businesses in this community. They were an invaluable uh, partner during the uh, Main Street reconstruction process. Uh, for the last three years, we have had a supplemental grant from VTRANS that we basically uh, made our W sub-recipient of, and they uh, did a lot of work with businesses and communicating about the project over the past three years, and, and we would not have been nearly as, as successful without that. Um, so I, I hope that in a couple of months, we'll consider their actual request for next year. Uh, the idea of the MOU to let them know whether we're going to go in a different direction is just to kind of give them time to start either figuring out how they're going to replace the money that they're going to lose or how they can kind of wind down uh, because uh, the way the MOU is structured, we kind of fund them from April 1st of one year through March 31st of the next. So our current funding an agreement that we have with them gets them their first three months worth of money for next year. So with that, unless anybody wants to drop a bomb and tell me that you're gonna <laughs> tell them you don't want them around anymore, um, you can turn it over. Um, Thanks, Bob. I'm gonna let Mark start. So yeah, another part of the memorandum of understanding between the town and the revitalizing water rate is that me as the economic development director, I provide two <laughs> reports. This one being the one that's due in August, and I have which, sent, which was sent. And I have hard copies if anybody would like one. Anybody on the select? Look forward also the public. <laughs> I sent those to you. Yeah. <laughs> I only have ten copies, so. <laughs> Bill, you have it. I've got it. Chris has. Chris, anybody in the public would like to take a look at it? There you go. Yeah. So this this report touches on what the economic development director has done since the beginning of the year into August. I can only speak on what has been done since about mid-March when I started my position as economic development director with Provide Life and Water Break. Uh, some of you have read the document, some of you have it in front of you now, but I'd like to just highlight on a few of the kind of important things that I'll, I'll take out of the report that that I've worked hard on uh, this time and I think might be, be pretty cool for the public to know if they have they don't know about it. So one of them is every month I publish a, a newsletter that goes out to the business community here in Waterbury around 270 recipients. And that gives them information on different grant opportunities, upcoming workshops, um, some highlights from businesses if they can post in an article or they have a, a cool event coming up. So that's a, a new thing for the business community here in Waterbury. Another uh, something else that I'm working on, or I was reached out by the um, ACPD, which is the Agency of Commerce and Community Development from the state of Vermont to do a request for information about not only demographic information about the town of Waterbury, but also um, available spaces with a footprint of more than 10,000 square footage for a confidential company to occupy if received a VEGI, which is a Vermont Employment Growth Incentive Program. And the company, as you all know now, public knowledge is MTX Group. They're a tech company 
an international tech company. They work a lot. We had a contract with the state of Vermont at the beginning of COVID to help work with contact tracing. And they are opening their northeastern headquarters here in Waterbury Center, Vermont. Um, something else to highlight on. Let's see. <laughs> um, okay, so a few months ago there was a grant that I was reached out to from, I believe it was the CDC. It's called the Building Communities Grant Program, Regional Economic Development Grant. And this basically will match capital dollars for, for a business slash company that wants to do physical improvements to their business to allow to retain or increase the amount of Vermont walk workers they have at their business. And I was reached out to support two different projects, one by the Vermont Beer Shopper and one by the new brewery on Stowe Street, uh, Creekville Beer, and both were each rewarded $15,000 from the grant. Um, and lastly, as, as requested by the town, or a member of Revitalizing Waterbury, in this case, I am that member, has been associated with the Waterbury Energy Plan Committee, and I help them, I support them in, in their, with their meetings. Recently, I had, we had been reached out by Efficiency Vermont, which was doing a free um, business consultation, and Waterbury, they now use Waterbury as their example when they go to reach out to other towns to do this because it's such a successful campaign. We had, I think we had 14 or so businesses all take place in this energy walkthrough and see how they could use the tax incentives that energy efficiency Vermont could provide for their business. Um, those are just a few highlights from these last seven months since I've been here. I'll, I guess I'll now open it if anybody has any questions, the public, anybody on the select board. Just, just before you ask questions, if you have any, um, I came to the board with the request to put a letter of support in for that vision grant for NPX. But I want you to know when, when Mark says that, you know, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development reached out to him for some information, that it wasn't something he could do in 30 seconds or five minutes. I mean, I'm sure it took him the better part of a week to gather the information that they were looking for. This was a, a big project and, and uh, you know, it, it paid off because this company is coming here. So. Yeah, I'd just like to um, add on um, Mark's been on for several years and uh, we've had two other economic development directors that we supported over the time. Uh, Mark's coming on at a really exciting period, as we all know, as Main Street is done, and uh, we're sort of looking into the future. Revitalizing Waterbury is just about to start the strategic planning process to figure out where we're going next and how we're going to support the town. And as you know, we support the town um, through the economic development director position, as well as with marketing and promotion um, and tourism. Uh, if you have noticed the uh, tour buses that are coming in every single day right now, about 20 plus of them are coming in uh, and we're personally greeting them. Uh, the design committee is involved in really what makes this town look beautiful, um, the flowers and the garlands. Uh, and uh, so it's all, there's a lot of work that we do for you and for the town. And uh, it's a real, um, bonus that the town supports um, a full-time economic development director position because we can do that much more, such as bringing in, um, uh, helping bring in new <coughs> uh, the retail market study we're undergoing right now, which we will share that information with you when it's completed. Um, these are all just key components as to how we figure out how to um, support the economic development and the businesses in the town. You know, I've got to say that actually today I was thinking about RW and. Uh, Good job for him. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I was thinking about how this particular organization differs from others, in my opinion, that 
these people are actually, you have goals and objectives that you are pursuing in such a manner that they're coming to fruition at such a rate that you can see the improvement before your eyes, you know? And, and, and I just think that some other organizations could take some real lessons from you guys. Um, and, and I appreciate what you do. Well, I'm just gonna share that it's three staff, but a huge number of volunteers. And we have three of our board members here with us, Teresa Wood, Ozo Thompson, and Carolyn Fox, who just joined our board. Yay. Um, uh, we can't do it by ourselves, but it's this community at Grit really um, loves to get involved and support us and uh, make these things happen. But it costs money to do it all. I mean, like any organization, so, including elected officials and all that, there's controversial things at times, but uh, I think your heart is definitely in the right place. And that, you know, everything that I've seen uh, so far, I approve of. Yeah. And for you, Mark, uh, hitting the ground and running, it seems like um, seven months, you've, you've accomplished some pretty good stuff here in a short period of time. So keep up the good work and we're glad to have you aboard. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to echo gratitude. It's amazing to see every day, like Chris said, there's a difference. Um, I don't know if now would be time to ask the question or if there's a, you can direct me when to ask for how to find, but I'm curious about the, um, like working on finding the tenant for the train station, <laughs> you know, right? So maybe now is not the time for an update, maybe it is. Um, and if not, how do we stay apprised of that process? What did I say? Oh, it is? How long is that? What? What? what is it? What's that? Uh, What's happening? I heard a rumor. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of rumors out right now. I'd just like to set the ground you know like everything crystal clear we are still you know still showing the place we are still there are some people that have you know given us offers and we're working to see if they fit the space and the community fit them as well we have not chosen a place there's there's a lot of work going on in the train station and that is to fix the platform so it's all on and track um, yeah we're and you know we it's a long process. We are looking for a tenant. We continue to advertise and we will take all offers. And we are, um, when people approach us, we bring them down. Mark uh, is spearheading this with uh, for us. Um, he's the primary contact with our commercial real estate agent. Um, I am proud of revitalizing Waterbury. We painted the train station this year. I haven't been painted in 17 years, 16 years, a lot of years. Um, and that was a major investment of money, uh, but we felt that with the station empty, with COVID, um, it was quiet. It was a good time to put some time into painting it. And it's a and uh, thank you to Teresa for putting the flowers up this summer. Mm -hmm. They were beautiful. Uh, so the building is ready to bring in a tenant, but it's, it's a long process. And, and everybody in here, it's not. <coughs> yeah, it yeah. Everybody does know that RW owns the train station, right? Should be. Oh, if you don't know, they do. We own the train station. <laughs> we own the train station. <laughs> <laughs> For your stakeholders with that group, are you talking to local businesses that are around it, or and and or who else? Oh, we're we're talking to everybody. Trust me, when we heard that it was empty, I started getting phone calls from locals and from far away. Uh, 10, 12, 14 businesses. We put them all to the commercial real estate agent. She reached out to everyone. We've shown it many 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 times to local people as well as um uh as well as companies and businesses all around vermont uh our we have some very specific goals for the train station it has to be a financially viable business um this is um, a major component of our um annual budget and uh, it's not an inexpensive building to maintain and to keep going plus we have a couple loans for the new debt Thank you for bringing that on to you guys. That's good. Um, one, so it's, it has to be financially viable. It has to um, be a company that, oh gosh, now I'm going to blend on all three of them. What are the three? A community minded company and sustainable. Sustainable, I think that's the other one. <laughs> it's just a lot. Yeah. Yes. So uh, they have to be able to afford the <laughs> rent and, and be, but they have to be a viable business. Um, we're not going to bring in a company that's 
why don't I try for the first time? Are, are there any types of business that are not um, that you feel that are not in the best interest of Waterbury to house at the train station? The truth is, is we're trying to steer away from an office setting uh, that would end up actually right. closing the doors and not making it um, sort of a community space. So um, we don't necessarily want lawyers or accountants, but the space is a, can easily has two components to it. So it could be stuff we could come up with a two different types of businesses. Um, it's really, we're learning that we have to be very open-minded as we think about this. And when we started, we were thought like, this is our dream tenant. Well, our dream tenant doesn't exist. <laughs> so we have to be very open-minded as we think about this. Um, just a suggestion, right. probably get Paul and Gail Brown. Oh, Paul and Gail Brown. Can get a phone call from the phone right now. <laughs> um, yes, there are plenty of businesses that are uh, like Cold Valley Cider Mill that might be an you know, opportunity for us. Good. Any other questions? Perfect. We're happy to show up anytime you need us. Appreciate that. Okay. So, are you all set there? I'm all set. I just want you guys to okay. say you're going to. <laughs> you all set, Mike? Yes, I am. I, I, just, I just just wondered if like, you know, something like a clothes shop or something like that was something that they wouldn't be looking for because they wanted it, something that more pr promotes Waterbury or something of that nature. But the We're answer open. is fine. We need to be open to everything and retail is one of our options. Right. Thanks. Looking. Yeah. You'll find something. Okay. Thanks so the next time in, you'll see Karen is when she's going to present their budget request for next year. Do we need to make a motion on this MOU? Um, or are we? The MOU, I believe, is ongoing unless you say it's okay. not. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And always reach out to us if you need us. Thanks for coming, everybody. Already. Recreation director, Nick. Nick <laughs> Nolan. <laughs> We love Ray. <laughs> Boy, you're not a clear room. <laughs> <Yeah, wow. laughs> Awkward. Good job. Um, yeah, I emailed this out on Sunday, but we printed some copies. So I don't know what part you want first to report. Yeah. Yeah, I'll see the report. So I don't think I've talked to you guys, especially since the end of summer. Um, I don't have anything additional to report tonight. Um, summer was great, besides the end. Uh, very busy, our busiest summer. Before refunds, we cracked six figures in revenue, which is a you know, personal goal. It's never come But when I came in, for instance, for example, uh, revenues were $50,000 for camp. So in three years, we we took in six figures, which is crazy. Okay. Um, that being said, we gave refunds out and lost our six figures. <laughs> but we uh, still beat what Bill and I had projected for revenues for summer camp by eight hundred dollars. So, um, yeah, you know, how many? What was the dollar amount of refunds? I forget. Close to eleven thousand. It might have been eleven thousand at the end of it, but um, we still came out on top. And actually, I had Michelle print our bookkeeper print. Um, a revenues update as of the start of October, and every rec revenue line has exceeded, um, and we're not even done the year. So, super great. Um, we started an after school program, uh, it sold out. I originally had 15 spots, and it's like you know, that's a lot. It sold out in like 20 hours, so I had to increase it to. Um, you know, I increased it to 20, and now we're at 25 some days. Um, you guys know the rec building is super small, so I can't really, you know, 
preparing for winter I can't really have you know, I more than 30 kids 25 30 kids in there um, you know at a time it's just with the pandemic and whatnot it's still happening with the kids especially I don't we're not making national music now. so <laughs> um, but that uh, program has made money uh, it's projected to make twenty thousand dollars as it is to make more um, if everyone pulls out for some reason it'll make a little less but um, that's that's uh, one source of our, our increased income. Um, swim lessons, we're back up again off season swim lessons. So um, typically uh, we rent, and, and up until the spring of 2020, we were renting um, the pool at First and Fitness, which is now Green Mountain Community Fitness in Berlin. Um, for off season lessons, I kept on pool staff throughout the year. Our pool director, Keith, was amazing. Um, and we had a really big clientele down there. The pool isn't right now they're not ready to rent out to external organizations yet so i you know scoured and scoured and then got uh, golden eagle uh, resort and stove to rent us uh, their pool i negotiated a much lesser rate than they're they were wanting to charge for us it's still it's still significant in comparison to what we we're paying we're paying around 700 dollars to rent for a fitness and pool for for eight week sessions we're paying 1200 at golden eagle um but it's a much nicer facility. We get use of the, the locker rooms, we get use of the conference room upstairs, we get use of the sauna, the hot tub, workout room. Um, so really our, our participants are really getting did really the, good things for their butt. Did the fee go up from previous years for that? For the rental? The swim lessons. No, like for the participants. So so oh, under the good structure, good. you'll see a getting to that. Um, yeah. Oh, I'll go okay, over it. I got you. I'll go over it. But um, um, usually, I'll just talk about featuring. Usually, when I do a program, right, these are our staples, but then we run other programs. And so I'm not every single time I'm going to offer like a tennis camp. Bang, we had to get um, Um, additional childcare programming. I mean, we're, we're pretty at the scene as far as my capacity and, and what I want to put staff on. But um, no, uh, everything's been great. We're playing for group light. Um, that's in December, December 4th. Uh, we have uh, Howling in the Park again. Um, we did that pre pandemic. I set up the blow up movie screen in the, in the park at, at Preston Parker. Shaw donates us down to candy and we dress up. Our staff dresses up and we. Love it. Um, we didn't do it last year because of the pandemic. We did Scarecrow on May, which is a Halloween of the Scarecrow costume um, competition. Um, that was popular, but I can't I can't do both, so I'm gonna do I'm gonna do one this year. Um, yeah, well, I'm down. I mean, summer was crazy. I have so much the details, but yeah, so the summer was great. Um, besides the end, we 
we've already outgrown our van. We're still using my truck just as much. Um, which, actually, can I talk about that right now? Yeah, I was going to ask you to talk about okay. that as well because we've got some grant money. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we have that $60,000 grant from Albertsons. Um, well, first, remind everybody, including me, we budgeted money this year to buy the van. We got a grant to help towards that, right? Yeah. So start there. Backing up to December of 2020, um, we got a grant from Albertsons um, for $10,000. And I wrote it to buy a van um, for logistics around town. Uh, we factored in $25,000 or $27,000 for capital improvement. $10,000 of that was covered by this grant. So the town only picked up a $15,000 bill for the van plus the $2,500 we budgeted for gas and maintenance. Um, we then got a $60,000 grant from Albertsons, the same place for um, the summer food for summer food program. Usually we rely on the senior center. They were operating this year in that capacity. Uh, our next option was um, uh, feeding hunger in Vermont. I'm not sure what it's called. What the, the school lunch program is for the summer. We have to go to Lamoille Union High School every day. They bring lunches back. Um, so that was our that was our backup plan, but I you know I wrote a grant and it, we got all sixty thousand dollars of it. Um, gosh, we passed that summer. So that was that was a crazy that was a crazy uh, endeavor because then I had to run around the restaurant and pick up food and deliver it, and so the van was tied up with food. So we, we we made yeah we made it we got that grant. And Nick used it as an opportunity both to provide food for the children at the rec program, plus also to uh, provide pandemic aid, if you will, during a time when the restaurants were not very busy and uh, made arrangements with how many? Four or five? Uh, like seven restaurants and stores in town. We did like cold qualified, we got donuts every once a week, we, you know, Stubby Cafe. Park Street, Park Road, Cafe, Milgill, Milgill, Cody, Zachary, Pizza, you know, Woodstock Farmers Market, they all chipped in somehow, um, chipped in. We paid full price <laughs> for them to, to do that, so I could use this grant up. So it was a kind of an economic uh, benefit to the town. In addition, the kids ate probably oh, the best yeah. they've eaten all, so the about all year. year. Yeah. Yeah. Benefited too whole, right? And staffed too. Um, so, you know, I had projected it that, you know, we I budgeted it and, and we were going to use just shy of two thousand dollars, and I was going to use it. You know, the, the food, has, the money has to be spent by the end of twenty twenty two or twenty one in December of this year. So I needed to spend it on logistics relating to food um, or something related to food. So I was going to maybe buy a new refrigerator for the rec building because we have an eighty nineteen eighty seven year one. Um, but I wanted the extra couple thousand in case for some reason one you know last week we got hammered with additional kids or something. Um, we had the opposite. So we have about $10,000 left over from that grant. And uh, since we'd already outgrown our, our, our 15 passenger van, and as part of our after school program, we, know we do a, a weekly outing. So um, we go to Stowe Playground, we went to Full Hall of Cider, kids love that, um, and Hope Davy Park, you know, just to get the kids there. Uh, but we have to take two trips to our van because we don't have um, seats. seats. Um, and then that gets tricky because you need to have that, you know, ratio, you need to have at least enough staff left at the building to stay with those kids while you have enough staff in the van and you have enough staff to leave with that group and come back. So a couple times I have a buddy that works at Umiac Outfitters in Stowe, um, you know, I can rent their 15 passenger van um, really cheap, like uh, 50 or $100 a day, which is crazy because if you try to rent it from a rental company, it's $300, $400 a day. Um, He's moving on, but I still, you know, contact there, but that's not a real, you know, regardless, that's not a reliable source. I'm just lucky right now. Um, so I pitched the idea to Bill that, you know, $10,000 left over is not going to, you know, front's not going to cost taxpayers anything right now. Can I buy a used minivan? Because, you know, in the summer, um, the big van was in, it's going to be, if we keep operating summer camp in three different areas to accommodate everyone, but it's still going to need to rotate equipment, supplies, and food, uh, whether we do a grant again or we get, you know, we do a little more about the Loyola Union, you know, food, or even the senior center. We can't have all 170 kids in the senior center. So 
we're going to need to transport food regardless. So um, that really tied up the van for additional programming, like for instance, the hiking and fishing camp. So I had to schedule that after camp was done, and I had to rent another van for that. You know, that's crazy. Um, so with a with an additional vehicle, we could use that to transport some of the stuff instead of my truck, and then the the van could be used for programming during the summer and during and during the year. Bill said, "Why stop at a minivan? Why not? Why not ask another 15 passengers?" Um, so while we have this money that we're allowed to use, you know, I checked with Albert since we're allowed to use it on a van um, because it will be used theoretically for logistics in the future for food. Um, uh, 15 passengers would be way more useful than a minivan. I mean, minivan will be useful and it will be covered by the van entirely. But if we can discount a, a 15 passenger by almost half because of the, the grant. Um, that would be even more helpful. So uh, that's that's the van. I guess that's the van subject. Anything you want me to add about it? No. Um, my thinking is that given the periodic conversations that I have with Nick and the growth of the of the rent program, um, this van has already shown its work and as he suggested that we we already have additional um, additional use we have use that's above and beyond the capacity of the existing van so um, there's two ways to go about it uh, and and i would be comfortable with either well, there's three ways. One is you say, no, we're not going to buy another van, and then we're going to have to have any other conversation. But um, there's the $10,000 that we have left over in the grant. Um, we could go ahead and buy a van, whether it's a mini van, I would recommend the 15 passenger van. Um, if we can get the same kind of deal, it was about 25 grand. So we'd have to would have to spend fifteen thousand dollars. That's not budgeted right now, uh, and there's no way to go around the fact that it's not budgeted. I can tell you, and I've told you in budget reports in the past, that we we really projected low on revenues, uh, and and we're going to exceed almost all of them. We've already got additional recreation revenues than than we thought we were going to have. We're going to get pilot payments that we didn't think we were going to get. We're getting current use payments. We will have the money to cover that. But if the select board is not comfortable with um, with buying a van before putting it in the budget and asking the voters, as opposed to buying it and just telling the voters we did it, um, I think there's an opportunity that we could communicate with Albertsons and tell them that the select board is committing to buy another 15 passenger van. We need to get an approved budget. We would like to keep your $10,000 until after town meeting. And then if the voters appropriate the additional 15,000 or whatever it is that we need, we'll buy the van with it. And if we don't, we'll send the $10,000. So that's the second way you could go about it. Um, I think you had, I'm not sure how much you need two vans at this time of year. Yeah, I mean, yeah, every, every week we need two vans. <laughs> so um, it, it's- So you're already using two vans? Yes, yeah, I, I decided- You're still, I, rent, you're still renting- When I Umiac? can rent Umiac vans, so they do beer for the <laughs> um, But I live in Stoke, so it's easy for me just to drop the truck off and grab the van and come here. Um, but there's days that they're it's booked, so and there's no other van available. So you know we have to scrounge for staff to get enough, you know, five staff on so two can stay with the kids, two can go with the other three, stay with those kids, and one can drive the van back and forth. So sooner the better. Sooner the better. But I mean for now I'm maintaining. Um but it definitely there's use right off the bat, obviously. So um and, and then there's additional things too. I've talked to our insurer because uh, you know, for about an Waterbury got wind that we got a van and you know. The history center you knows we have a van, and so um, I, you know I've, I've spoken with our insurers about renting out the van um, because they're finding it just as far as these organizations understanding there's no van available to rent. Uh, I don't know if you know, 
So, you know, we can we can rent it as long as staff, one of our staff that are you know large band certified drives it. And so how I've been doing it, I've rented it twice, um, you know, for hundred dollars a day plus staff rate. And um, the you know the history center, I'm gonna be leaving um, mid-October. The history center wants to rent the van on a Friday for a history tour with the or for the seniors, I think. Um, Bill Woodrick might be driving that because I'm not gonna be here. But um, you know, there's there is revenue that's going on vacation. It's not yeah. And for a minute ago, <laughs> no, sorry, 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 going on, going on But um, so the, uh, on the side note, I do not want to get in the business of renting, but I think you know, for organizations like RW who want to do like a, a writer's tour, um, and you know, the history center, I, I think there's there's some organizations you can rent to that are like they're affiliated to, but I definitely don't want to get the business to be for, for a rental van company. But that being said, there that's a revenue stream as part of the van. Um, I don't want to focus on that. It's we we pay for the van in a few years with with the program we can offer for it. Um, but there is that added bonus to the van is getting you by more than just us um, the potential for the for the year. So I just want to express my continuing concern for uh, I'm not saying no to this ask by any stretch. I just want I always have this concern in the back of my head of outpacing our growing pains. That's the right way to say it, but I think I you know what I get getting at um, by just taking on too much uh, expense if, if you had a crystal ball and you could look into the future and say revenue source will always outpace you know the cost of, of structuring this rec program keeping it going um, you don't foresee that happening in the near future. In other words, uh, you think we're good for now as far as I mean, definitely. I mean, since this, the, the I mean, is there ever, is there ever going to be a high point where you, we've grown this program so big that now our revenue source starts to fall off and you know, we have a we have an expense that we have to maintain. No, I think that's always a, a concern of yeah, my, I, with anything in the back of my head. Um, I mean, the past four years, revenue is correct. Yeah. Increased expenses have not increased as much as revenue has increased. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think I'll try to increase that. Um, we're at a point where we need some of these things if we're going to get rec if we're rec is going to meet the demand uh, for the community. It's not it's not like we're just giving it to the community. We're collecting on this and making money. The after school program brought in close to forty thousand dollars and we've spent five, six, seven thousand dollars just on just just on stat. Like that's all it's been cost so far. Um, part of the ploy for that was because we're offering these outings, right? So it's it's we're trying to be creative in our program offerings. But regardless, it's it's the revenue is there. It's, it's child care is always going to be a demand. It's an increasing demand. Um, you know, we could have half the participants and still be breaking even. I mean, so, you, have, you have a great grasp on, you know, this concept of, of keeping the revenue source ahead of the, the cost. Yeah. yeah. Well, I not going to use No, he, he, he does understand. I mean, Nick and I have conversations a lot that. And he said it right at the top of this meeting that he builds every program to break even. And if he doesn't get enough participation to break even, we don't run the program. That's just how it goes. So is there an example of something that you put out there and not enough people signed up for? No. <laughs> so, I don't have one, no. And, and typically, the number of participants that we need to break even um, is relatively low, and I will say this: that you know, um, my concern with 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 this as we go forward is, you know, Nick is very organized. He's he's got a network of people out there that he's come to know over the years, 
and people are willing to do this work on a part-time basis because it's supplementing other jobs they have that they probably don't feel that they can make enough money and that you know there's a lot of gig employment if you will out there and it's probably a term we use in the wrong way but people in Nick's cohort uh, in terms of age are looking right now they, they need two three four jobs and what is the kind of uh, you know make make their lives make, make your goal and, and 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 what that allows us to do right now is to have these jobs where we pay reasonably competitive wages but there's no benefits that go along with any nick's the only one in the rec department that gets any benefits at all and uh so it's a relatively low overhead right now um if a pin gets pulled out and key people go away and the thing kind of crumbles. Well, then, you know, we just don't have programs to run. We don't pay we sell enrollees the yeah. and we sell them. Yes. You know, I mean, it, it's really as simple as that right now, Chris, yeah. that these are pretty low overhead programs. And at, at some point, the pressure comes. We've already looked at, oh, community centers and stuff like that uh, in terms of facilities because. We could have a bigger after school program if we had a bigger facility. Um, but then you gotta find more people. So it's it's a little bit of a uh, cat chasing its tail kind of deal. Well, Bella, I was gonna ask Nick if he needed any help finding people for the Thanksgiving break, but now I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. Um, yeah, and Chris, I'll I'll point a bit alluding to a little bit, but uh, we're at a bubble as far as as I am utilizing as much staff. A lot of them are not a lot, but some are doing favors. You know, Keith, our school director, is a teacher at Ramallah Union. He's he's said multiple times the only reason he's doing winter lessons, right, is because of me. That's great, but regardless, I still need someone to do winter, like some folks to do winter lessons. So, um, you know, they're in, indisposable, but to say as far as as positions go, but. Um, I'm gonna need help. We are we are at we're doing more for one person a one person full time department than any other other town that has one person. I know I've talked to my colleagues in the field. Um, we could offer more programs if we had more if we had more staff available. So uh, I think Bill's already mentioned it once, but I'm I'm budgeting this year for a full time assistant. Um, it'll be covered by revenues, right? We're making enough of the after school program, the other programs that they would theoretically take on and be covered. Um, so it should come at an extra, extra additional expense to taxpayers. Um, and, and if budgeted, it won't. Um, but I just I want to make sure I set that tone that, that we could go two directions. We can, we can maintain and kind of stay small and not really meet the need. We can go and meet the need and still be making you know potentially more money at the minimum break even. Um, I just want to make sure you understand that I know um, up in Newport, if I heard from Leanne what happened, because I didn't even get a chance to talk to her, but that's happening with a lot of people in my position right now. So um, I just want to make sure it's important that there's support for REC. Um, I think the, the numbers show that obviously for a revenue, we're, we're making revenue, it's not like we're losing money. Yeah, no, I think that, that some people in the town have always had a misconception that I've always been against that. Yeah, I don't know your yeah, so. That's not the case. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm happy you're on board. I'd hate to see you get burned out uh, and decide to. Well, I say that because it, it came close this summer. Yeah. Like it, it, it came close. Yeah. So. Well, my daughter's in the, was in the same boat that yeah. you're in. And, uh, it happened to her. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that and many other reasons that. Right. You know. Yeah. But uh, uh, well, it's good news. I'm, I'm glad to hear everything that you told us tonight. Um, and like I said, you got a good grasp on the revenue source versus the expense side. And uh, sounds like you're not letting things get out of hand. So I'm I'm all for whatever you wish to do with, with another band. I think you had a good idea of asking to hang on to the 10 grand unless he, he feels he needs it now. What do you say? It's up to you guys. I can use it now. Sure. Save 
if we're going to buy a van, then why don't you know why spend a hundred dollars every week to rent if I can every other week? Um, you know, any additional tax expense to have to make it work. I can still make it work. Great. So but, why don't we why don't we on the as far as the van is concerned, let Nick and me uh, talk and look at the current budget at the meeting on the 18th. You can come back, or I can come back. We'll be away. Uh, and and make a decision as to whether we can buy it this year and just be done with it, or if we have to wait until we go out. So let us look at uh, look at the budgets and see where we are and to make a more informed recommendation on that. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then I did ask Nick today. Um, Bob and Meg are still here. I see. Um, so we applied. The rec committee applied for a VOREC grant to look at the Hope Baby Park, um, this golf course, the whole facility. Uh, where do we stand on that? Yeah, for like a long range financial plan. And uh, they got the VOREC mm -hmm. got bombarded. And so they need more time to go through mm -hmm. the hundreds of applicants. So we have, they pushed it back, I think, until November. Um, so we won't have an answer for a while. But so they are both the the agency is still reviewing all the applications. The decision should have been made mm -hmm. by now, but they yep. have so many applicants, they need more time to yep. review them. So they're hoping sometime mid November, I think, I think it's late November. November, early November. But did they tell you that they were partially funded? Like if you ask a certain amount, were they partially funded or was it just being they don't think it's a full? They they partially funded yeah. in the past, so it's it all depends on the pool. Right now, I think they got four hundred percent of the the pool fund fund they have. So um, they might might take parts of it and fund like fund less of it, fund less of it. You know, just scale it down. It's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I think the community feasibility study grant was all right, and they they we asked for forty something thousand, and we got thirty something thousand. Mm -hmm. So um, they're they're known to, to give smaller amounts if it's potentially going to go to more. Okay. Probably gonna happen, mm -hmm. but we won't know. They're they're trudging through all the applications. Um, I think this month. So. Okay. So then you got a proposal yeah. for the board to. So I know I just talked about on. how much money we're making, but um, so you know, just in order to stay uh, ahead of it, uh, these are really modest maintenance and inflation drive cost increases. Um, you know, our summer camp. Uh, we cut out field trips because of the pandemic. We couldn't take kids on buses and we were going to take the vans. And um, we still can do that, but um, you know, it's the amount of children we're serving um, is increasing every year. I mean, you, you know, this year we had 173 kids um, enrolled throughout the eight week program, whether that was for the eight week session or one week sessions at a time, 173 different children. Um, so, Kind of hard to do that. Even with two vans, will be hard to do that. So we want one to field trips back, one to be able to rent, you know, like what we used to do um, with busing. Purchase transportation used to be our our go-to, but uh, they sold, um, and so the next closest uh, in, in cost is Lumo Valley Transportation, and it's it's double what we used to pay. Um, so you know, I'll get creative with the budget in order to see how many filters we can actually go for. But that's just an example of one cost that's gone up significantly that we haven't, um, we've taken out of the budget for the past two years. Um, so I think I've proposed a $25 increase for residents and a $25 increase for non-residents for the eight week block. Um, it's still, for residents, it's still less than $100 a day for child care. It's less than $2 an hour for the amount of uh, child care we provide. Um, $100 a week. Less than $100 a week. You said it Yeah. Sorry. I'm thinking to myself, what is my friend pay a week? A week. <laughs> a week. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a bargain. That's it, a it's a bargain. So, yeah. and that's, we, you know, we serve a lot of low income families. Um, so we can't really drive up the cost significantly. Um, but I'm, from, from what I'm projecting for next year, this is what I'd like to increase summer camps to. Um, many camps. Uh, been around 150, 165 for residents. The last week charge was 165 for residents, 190 for non residents. I'd like to make that um, kind of synonymous with the rec, the summer camp, rec week only camp rate, which is $175 a day for residents, 200 for non residents. 
still a bargain. Um, you know, the next closest is um, the YMCA and the Pancota, or uh, they call live wires during the summer or the winter school year, and, and they charge more than what we charge by quite a bit. So um, I think that's a, a massive for a 10. I'm looking to increase it $10 for residents and $5 for non residents. Um, the other increase is the swim lessons. Like I already said, I, I've already budgeted this fall session at this price. Um, it's what I've come up with that will, uh, you know, economically make sense for the department of the town. Um, but I just kind of want your final approval if I can keep using that rate of 85 for residents and 120 for non residents. Um, and that's swim lessons all year. Yeah, down. here in this at our pool in the summer and then um, the off season lessons here by the facility. Should Did I just get a lesson with memberships or not? Oh, uh, well, the first full year in 2019, um, I changed it. I, I brought it to the select board, but I changed it from a free lesson with uh, membership to 50% off lessons. Um, and we saw a dramatic increase in revenue. So I've kept it that way. You, you buy a family membership at, for the summer, you get half off the lessons that are full. For the off season, there's no discount for membership or anything like that because um, we have pretty thick parameters we're working in. Um, do you want me to stop there or keep going to facilities? Keep going, all right. Cool. Yeah, so the facility rentals, the, the youth and adult league is um, uh, the purely inflationary costs. We had, there's a major paint shortage this year, and um, we had to start using interior, exterior, white paint uh, to line the field just because there was there was none of it and there was no field line of paint um, available and it, and it fortunately for some reason does not look like there's an end of sight there's the panel they can't find the cans to put the paint in they can't make the plastic to put the, the big five gallons buckets to paint in I mean Chris you probably run into that with your well that's what, video. not to interrupt you but that's one of the things I was thinking about as you're going down through this list the use of inflationary cost or are they based on what you're seeing now or what you're projecting? Both, both. Because I think they're, like you just stated, this isn't over yet. No. And, and uh, these facility fees, the Youth and Adult League haven't been updated since 2019. That was when the when they were um, that was kind of the accumulation of that fee structure. Uh, I haven't done a projected fee structure yet for the next two years, but I just wanted to get, uh, you know, could be a year by year basis if there's uh, some entry trade. So I, I I think it's modest, you know, for instance, a youth league season. So youth soccer happens in the fall. Um, we line the fields every week. We mow the grass, we provide the, the nets and the goals. Um, the $500 can co doesn't cover what, what we put into it, but we can't charge a youth soccer league the thousands of dollars that we put into it because then they wouldn't exist. Um, so I think the fifty dollar increase for both the uh, youth and adult league seasons are are reasonable. Um, the rec building isn't really available for rent now because we're using it all the time. But um, Chris Chris knows we I put a bunch of work into it at the end of twenty twenty. Um, uh, we got a donation for the floor from the, the company to, to to put a new floor in there. So I put an uh, uh, impact proof you know, meant for kids vinyl flooring. We repainted it, um, put giant windows in um, that I got at a resource, 50 bucks each is a deal. Um, it's a very nice building compared to what it used to be. Um, so I think if there are, is an opportunity, maybe during a weekend, we're not using it for program, the COVID's over, um, if we rent it out again for birthday parties, I, I think 150 for residents and 175 is, is still a deal. I think, honestly, we'd want to increase it in a year or two. Um, but just for this year, this is what it is. Um, the tournament add-on fee, so this is listed in that fee structure that was approved in 2017, um, but every time uh, there's a tournament here or a tournament at any of the parks for any of the leagues, um, there was a $50 add-on fee, right, to cover the additional um, portalet usage, the trash that we have to collect, um, and the prep that we do for it, the baseball game that needs to be dragged in for it, Set up throughout the week, and we, we mow the grass pretty short. We do, you know, we do some extra work for a tournament. Um, I'm suggesting a fifty dollars increase for that, just because um, it it's becoming 
popular, I guess, the hosts at our facility, um, and we want to make sure that they're they're worth the um, they're worth the cost. And uh, we do put a lot of effort into it. I would like to make sure we recuperate the extra effort we put on on Friday, for instance, having we park guys out there doing whatnot, or if there's a tournament up at the at the disc golf course. So the rec committee potentially presents presents a different fee structure. For now, I just like to act as maintenance cost um, or inflation price. And then garden fees, um, they're the cheapest in the state. It's they're fifteen dollars for a, a twenty by twenty plot. Um, if you're a resident, and twenty if you're a non-resident. I'll get residents from South Burlington and Essex in Montpelier to come to us, and I, I never understood why. So one of the gardeners told me it cost eighty bucks in South Burlington mm -hmm. for them to have a garden plot. In Montpelier, it's sixty. Um, I no means want to screw people to plant vegetables, but we have increased what we do as far as the gardens go. I go out twice a year and spend a whole day in the fall, a whole day in the, in the spring. Uh, myself and one other person will pull, pull stakes, pull things that can't be rototill. We contract out rototilling. Um, and then we, you know, we have a giant compost pile that we end up turning with our big loader multiple times just to get it, to get it, you know, cooking. Cooking. Yeah, I guess that's the right word. Um, so I, I'm, I think it's super reasonable. The gardeners I talked to over the last two summers that they would definitely pay more for our gardens. Um, so I'm just uh, requesting we move that to thirty dollars for a resident and um, forty dollars for a non-resident. And those are my fees. Everything else, like when I run a basketball camp or if I run a Harry Potter camp or a science camp, right? That's contingent on the deal I work out with the instructor and the space facility rental fee. So if I rent across it from a classroom, what their cost is and um, I, you know, I say that try to stay in the parameters of this, but I will increase the fee or decrease the fee if it's, you know, if we're getting a heck of a deal or if we're having to pay more just because we don't want to, don't want to screw taxpayers. We want to make this, keep this as affordable as possible. Um, but we also make sure we're, we're covering our expenses and, and making some money, but um, at the minimum, covering our expenses. So these are the staple, staple fees. Well, the money you make always goes back into it. So yeah. that's, that's part of the process. Without it, would be failure. Um, I don't have any issue with any of your increases. I think they're modest at best. And, and inflationary costs, just to let you people know, in my world, I just priced out some electrical conduit today. What would, what would normally cost me a $14 for a three inch piece of 10 foot conduit is now $68 and change. It's just outrageous. And the guy telling me that on a weekly basis they're getting phone calls for increases and it's just not stopping. And then, yeah, the money stretch. But uh, yeah, I'm tickled right to death of how you present it. Next camera, I think it's I think it's it though. Is it going one ninety to two hundred? Oh yeah, it's ten. Yeah. Okay. So that was the second one. Yeah. Right. I think we need yeah, there should be a motion to uh, approve the proposed fees for 2022. So seconded. Any further discussion? Mike, he's asleep by now. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Do these aye. for 2022? 2022, yeah. Uh, the some lessons have already been just make yeah. sure we covered our costs. Like, yeah, so, but. Just to say, um, approve the proposed. We can make them effective immediately because none of them really are forward. Any more? Great job, so like uh, always. When you said 173 enrollees <coughs> earlier, was that just the summer rec program, or was that uh, rec camp and mini camps? That's just the summer. That's just the summer camp. Yeah. So pushing 200. We're getting close, yep. right? So even without the pandemic, it's likely we're going to need to continue with the two or three venues, right? And yep. we don't have enough room for under <laughs> right down there, right? Right, no, we definitely don't. So yeah, it, it, we're going to keep it that way. It's important that we continue to rent these spaces. Um, they're reasonable. Yeah, yeah, you've done a great job with it. I just wanted to make sure that 
we all understood that it wasn't just because of the pandemic. Right. And that's why it started. It's so, why it started. We kept it that way because it increased. It clearly let other people in that wanted to come in. So, thank you. It's funny what what good can come out of that, right? Right. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, man. I don't think you're saying. I'm blaming it. Health insurance. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody want the memo so you can read it? Or you are all set? I'll take it. So this is the time of year that we have to make uh, some decisions about our health insurance offerings for uh, the next calendar year. Health insurance plans run with the calendar, uh, January 1st through uh, December 31st. Um, for the first time in a long time, uh, I can report that health insurance rates have not gone up significantly, in fact, uh, Blue Cross rates uh, almost, well, all dropped in the vicinity of 7%. And now they're much more in line with the MVP rates. Um, Danny, uh, I kind of keep this recommendation or the summary part at the beginning the same every year. It's just kind of a historical uh, look back to, sh to tell new members how we got where we are. But uh, the town for several years now has uh, rather than uh, the traditional way in the past of saying we have Blue Cross insurance and we're going to offer you these three plans, choose which one you want. Uh, because we are part of the uh, Vermont Health Connect, the health exchange that was created when Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act was adopted a number of years ago. We offer our employees a monthly allowance that they can use to purchase health insurance that's best fit for their family. And three years ago, now I think it was 2019, rather than just say you could choose any Blue Cross plan, we made any plan offered through the exchange available. So Blue Cross and Vermont uh, MVP offer group plans uh, for small employees, which we are under 100, and we all have to buy our health insurance through uh, the Vermont Health Connect. So these rates are rates that are made available to any small group in the state. It's not just municipalities, uh, individuals out there, if they want to buy a plan through the Vermont Health Connect, these are the plans that they would get to choose. So um, we have used the rate of inflation and the rate of increase in the health care, uh, health insurance costs as a means to kind of propose a new uh, offering to the employees. And in some years when health insurance rates have gone up dramatically, like 10, 15 percent, and Inflation was very low, 1.5%, something like that. You know, a few years ago, that was the situation. We we gave the employees 4.5% more for their allowance to, to reflect the fact that health insurance rates went up quickly, but the rest of inflation was was not growing so, so fast. So if you've all read this, what I'm recommending is a 2% increase from 2021 to 2022. Uh, the rate, the increases are on page two. So right now you can see for an employee who is single in 2021, the allowance that we've given that employee is $811 a month. Uh, I'm proposing it goes to $827. Um, I did put in here that while some may argue or may suggest, I shouldn't say argue, that uh, maybe given the rates are going down in Blue Cross and are 
ranging from negative 2% to positive 3% on MVP. You know, maybe some think it's a year that we should just say no increase. We're going to stick where we are now. And if you did that, um, employees would have some additional costs that they had to bear. Um, but I would also caution you that, as I indicated here, inflation, and as Chris just mentioned, you know, inflation is right now running at more than 5%. Per annum right now. I mean, the 12 months ended uh, August or September. I guess it was August this year. The September numbers weren't available yet. Um, you know, inflation is pretty hot right now. So I would suggest a 2% increase. It's a modest increase. We'll keep most of our employees kind of right around where they are now in relation to the cost of these plans. Uh, and it's a nod to the fact that inflation is going pretty quickly. And medical inflation didn't happen to the degree that it often does in 2021. And I think that's a lot to do with the pandemic because there was so much medical, especially elective procedures that were put off because hospitals and medical providers didn't have the capacity to do those kinds of elective uh, medical treatments because of the, the pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that if you just stuck with 0% this year, you'd end up with having to really ratchet it up significantly next year to, to make it up. So I think 2% is a, is a, reasonable, um, a reasonable number. Uh, and I would recommend that that's what you offer. For the employees who don't take coverage, we do have a handful of employees who are eligible for health insurance who receive their coverage through a spouse or a partner. Um, uh, about five or six years ago, I think we started to offer them a small stipend, uh, uh, you know, a monthly payment uh, to just recognize the fact that uh, there is a cost and you know the cost would be significantly more if they took our insurance. So I'm recommending that that increase from 125 a month to 135 a month, which is an 8% increase, but it's a small $10 a month. So. Bill, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm supportive of the 2% um, raise. I just have to go. Uh, the building I'm in is closing, so I'm going to have to sign off. So uh, you can continue on, but uh, you know I'm I'm supportive of that two percent raise. Thanks. I'll make a motion go. to approve it. Yeah, I guess not. Yeah, approve it. Okay. Yeah. Like. I'll make that motion if. <laughs> What'd you do? Bribe the guy? Thank you. <laughs> And uh, also the increase for the. Yeah. Is there a second? I'll second. Further discussion? So you said that MVP went down 7% or Blue Cross? Blue Cross. And, and so the Blue Cross Platinum plan, and you know, that we have very few people who take that. But, the Blue Cross Platinum Plan for a single person will be 882 a month yeah. this year, which is 7% lower than it was last year. So it was about 905 last year, I think. I don't have last year's numbers here. But still, in relation to MVP, uh, the, the Platinum Plan for MVP for a single person is $811 a month. So it's still, uh, $72 less than Blue Cross. It provides the exact same benefits because it's a standard plan and the standard plans in the state have to all be the same, it's the same benefit package. So Blue Cross is, I think it may be partly a competition issue with them. I mean, they're significantly higher than MVP in 2021. We had a number of our employees who were you know, diehard Blue Cross 
folks that when they saw that, okay, I'm going to be given a monthly allowance and I can buy Blue Cross and not have any left over to go into an HRA or an HSA, or I can buy MVP and have some money to put into those other funds. We've had a migration towards MVP, but I still think we should offer both uh, our plans. So if a, if a single employee wanted to take the platinum plan, if they chose to take Blue Cross, they'd have to pay some of their own money towards it. With MVP, it's right there. I guess, you know, they uh, give up that $17. Well, I guess what I was hoping for was that the overall cost of return had dropped and that we could maybe use that as a benefit to, with an increase that would help buffer next year's possible increase. But you clarified the whole thing, so we're really not, we're gaining some ground, but we're really not gaining. Yeah, and you know, for someone like me, okay, and, and I can talk about me because it's about me, I can't necessarily talk about Carla, but I take my, um, my monthly benefit and I buy the plan that I want and I put the balance into an HSA, which I've built up over time. Um, some people take the money and buy a platinum plan and they don't have any left over to put aside for other things. But they make those choices based on the needs of their family. I'm relatively healthy, don't have any underlying conditions, things that I know of. And, and, and you know, I think I can manage with that high deductible plan that if something bad happens, even a car accident that was my fault, and there's no other insurance company, you know, if you hit me, if I just went off the road and I had a you know bad injury, you know, the plan that I take, um, I would be on the hook for out of pocket maximum um, You know, my out-of-pocket maximum is almost sixteen thousand dollars a year. I can take that risk because I've put some money aside. Now. Other people who have medical conditions, they know they're going to spend that money. So to them, they'd rather take the money with the platinum plan. This is a good way, uh, and I don't think it's the time to do it now, but. <clears throat> This monthly benefit that you are providing to the employees, they use some of it to buy a health insurance premium and the rest of it they use either for an HSA or an HRA or they spend it all for premium. This is a tax advantaged way of providing them compensation because you know, if you gave somebody an $827 a month Salary increase while you pay retirement, you pay Social Security, and they pay income taxes on that. You give them $827 a month in a health insurance benefit, even if you're putting it into an HSA. There's no tax, there's no fight there, there's no retirement that gets taken out of that. So if you were going to say, you know, well, we could increase this by 5%, and then next year, you know, not give them much as, as much as a pay increase. There's some consideration that could be given to that, but that might be for some future discussion because there's there's too many levers to pull and too many questions to ask of employees to see how that impacts everybody. You know, it would be beneficial to me, but there's other people that it wouldn't do much for. So I think the two percent is a piece. And then I'm not holding it to any specific number, but the majority of the, the employees are they are they uh, on the like the more of the family plan, or are they on the? Well, it's kind of split. Or it's it's kind of, kind of split. Management? We have a number of single people now. You know that was an anomaly when I first started. That was unusual, but we have a number of employees who are are single or who take single plans. Um, 
as some of us age, we used to have family plans, but now we have two person plans. And then, you know, we do have a couple of employees with, with families, but I, I think it's more evenly dispersed than it used to be. I think 25 years ago, Chris, it was almost all family plans. So we should be able to not pick one side or the other. Right. No, I don't have any problems, issues with it. I guess motion for date and seconding. So all we need to do is say aye. 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 Any <laughs> okay, great. All right. Next board item. So you've taken the entertainment ordinance yep. off the table. This mark's not here yet. Um, the discussed board meeting schedule. Uh, when I put this together last week, I thought I was not going to be here on the 18th of October, but now I am going to be here on the 18th of October. I am going to be traveling to Georgia in late October through, I don't know, I think we're going to leave on the 28th and then come back around the 11th or 12th or something like that. Um, I can participate in the November, whatever that meeting is, November 2nd, November, what's the first Monday, November, November, November 1st, November 1st. So I can participate in that meeting by Zoom, uh, and then I more than likely will be back to the second meeting. So I was going to see if we could switch up when the 18th meeting was, but now I don't know. Why don't happen? I'm not going where I thought I was going on the 18th of oh, October. So we're going to be in the We're supposed to. I mean, I think yeah. we've got some homework to do. So, yeah. Well, I'm supposed to be on my yearly trek north at the end of October. But I'll be in the noon now that we have it. So, when do you go up there? I'm shooting for. Shooting to be there the first weekend of the third week of October. Okay. So from October, you know, into November. Anyway, so the, the, the 18th, you'll be here or yeah. by Zoom? Be, you know, should be here by the time. Okay. And if you can participate by Zoom, that's, that's great. That's fine. So there's really no adjustment that we have to make. On this schedule. Mm -hmm. Motion to adjourn. We have no, one more thing. Yeah, yeah. Appointment of the zoning administrator. Oh. Zoning administrator. Okay. At your last meeting, um, I brought to you the recommendation of the planning commission to appoint Ann McCormick as the uh, assistant. Planning and Zoning Director. Cam started work Thursday last week, successfully completed his background investigation, so he started work last Thursday. Um, if you remember, I told you that I wanted, I was hoping that we were going to be able to appoint Steve as the, the Zoning Administrator and the Planning Director, uh, and we had to take that off last time because the Planning Commission didn't actually nominate him. So the Planning Commission at their last meeting now has nominated Steve Lostbeach for the position and we'll have to fill it in later. The Planning and Zoning Director, I believe it is. And I would recommend to the board that you appoint Steve to a three-year term as the Zoning Administrator, effective in the So moved. Discussion. Um, two years, effective one. Yeah. He's the director of zoning, and also we have to put in the zoning administrator. Yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> figure out the actual wording, but <laughs> zoning and administrator he is yeah. the zoning, you know, he's yes, okay, I'll be the director of because his position now. Right. Specifically includes acting as zoning administrator, uh, not just when the zoning administrator is not here. Now we have two people that can do it, so okay. we have to appoint him. So 
they've made the motion and seconded. Did Ross and I have any? No, no, no more comments or questions. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. What's the name on it? Two four. Motion to adjourn. Second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All those approved. Um, um, all right, out of here. Thanks, bro. Thank you all. So, what were you saying about you were going to say something about Thanksgiving?